Good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you to our service this morning. We sure are glad that you're here. If you happen to be here for the very first time, this is your first visit with us, we want to offer you a special welcome. Also, if you would, first time guest, there's a little tear-off section on the bulletin. If you would take that and fill that out and either place that in the offering plate as it goes by or just give that to one of the ushers as you leave, that'd be great. Make sure that you take your bulletin. A lot of stuff in there. Uh, this is something BBS. This is not far off. BBS. We've been praying for this for the better part of about six months. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's next Monday. You guys say Monday week. A week from tomorrow, it begins. So continue to be in prayer for that. There's a list of uh, some craft needs in there. You can get some of those, drop those by. And if you would like to work in BBS, they still have a spot for you. So uh, there's a sign-up person in the hallway in the information center. They'd be glad to sign you up. Also, the women on missions, they're actually making dresses for some uh, Syrian refugees. So if you actually, ladies, if you have some extra fabric, or if you'd like to help them, if you see Becky Land, I'll bet she could hook you up. And then the Young at Heart, this Tuesday night, got a uh, hamburger dinner. That will be a great time. And tonight, we don't have anything scheduled tonight. Happy Father's Day. Enjoy your friends and family, and we'll see you next time. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, when me and Jill uh, were getting married, we decided to engrave in each other's ring something. And uh, we decided not to tell each other what it was going to be. So I put something in her ring, and she put something in my ring. I had no idea what she was going to put in there. So then we got married, and I got to take the ring off. And I looked inside, and it says, truly, truly. And that's what she chose to put in there. It's interesting because the words truly, truly are in the Bible, and Jesus uses those words. And uh, the reason why she put that in there is because when we first started dating, um, we like to, uh, the, the, it's not lie, it was, we like to deceive. It would be fun to say something a little extreme, like here's an illustration. Um, we wanted to get to know each other. We're talking, we're at a restaurant. And she says, we're getting to know each other. I'm learning about her family. And she says, my sister has a, a problem hearing, you know, a hearing problem. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, well, my, my, my aunt, she's blind, all right? And so we keep going, that kind of stuff. Truth is, my aunt's not blind, all right? And so uh, we go, and we're talking, and later to find out, I met her sister, and she actually did have a hearing problem. So I did what every guy would do, and I called my aunt. And I said, aunt... Sally, I just want you to know, this is going to be weird, but Jill's coming to Spartanburg, and I told her that you were blind. So could you do me a favor, and could you just pretend like you're blind? Best aunt ever. Uh, second best aunt. Sorry, my other aunt's here too today. So second best aunt. <laughs> Stupid. Ugh. All right, so we get to the house, and as we're driving to Aunt Sally's house, I'm trying to talk to Jill about how you can like, let the, the blind person know who you are, how they can see you and get to that kind of stuff. So we walk into the house. It's the best thing ever. We walk into the house, and there she was sitting in the chair with the sunglasses on, right? She's like, is that you, Jill? Is that you? Come here. And so Jill literally walks up. Jill is as sweet as she can be. She's like, okay, come here. And she came up to her, and she's going to start touching her face, that kind of stuff, and boom. So naturally in our relationship, we had to have a line of when we won't play with each other. We won't joke anymore. And so we developed the phrase of truly, truly. So if we're ever teasing and one of us actually says the phrase, Chuck, truly, truly, and I'd be like, truly, truly, I, I promise. And so we, that's, that's our way of being honest. Well, in Scripture, again, Jesus, who is not like Chuck, who never deceived, always spoke the truth. Yet he still had to use lines like truly, truly for people to understand because there's times in Scripture that what Jesus is teaching is so difficult to believe that he had to actually say, okay, I'm serious here. I am, what I'm about to say is truth. So truly, truly, I tell you. And that's going to be something we're going to see today when we look at some scripture today. So let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much, God, just for who you are, for your love, for the fact that it's Sunday morning, that today we can come together with a bunch of people that have one thing in common, and that's Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll just bless this time that we have. And as we get to worship through giving, through singing, through studying your word, God, I pray that you'll help us to truly focus on why we are here today, why we walked in this room, why we chose to get dressed and to come into this sanctuary. Help us to worship you. And as we look at your word and we get to stuff that may be difficult to hear, Lord, help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, thank you so much, Chuck. We're looking forward to hearing your message today. We're so glad you're here today. And a couple things I want to do. First of all, I want to thank you. I just returned from the Southern Baptist Convention on Thursday. It was a great meeting. And I'm so thankful to be part of a denomination that does the things that we do. The, the theme for the convention was gospel above all. And that's a great theme. And we want to continue that theme in our own church ministry, in our own lives. The gospel is above all. I love what Paul said in Romans 1. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. So we had a great meeting. Uh, continue to pray for our denomination. I'll be sharing some other things about it in, in the days ahead. Now, today's a special day. Today is Father's Day, and fathers are important. And I want to just say to you men who are fathers, we want to honor you today. We're grateful for you. I'm grateful for my father. I'm grateful for Ryan's father. I'm grateful for my son-in-law, Myers, who is the father of my grandchildren, my son, Hudson, who is the father of my grandchildren. I'm grateful for my grandfathers who were believers, thankful for Ryan's grandfathers who were also believers. And so this is so important that we as men who are fathers, that we would love the Lord and love our wives and love our kids and our grandkids. And I just am so thankful to have a day to honor fathers. So what I want to do, I'm going to ask everybody, who, every man who is a father, if you would stand at this time, just all the fathers, if you'd stand and remain standing for just a second. And we want to honor you guys, so let's hear it for the Father. God bless all of you. Thank you so much. And uh, we don't have a gift for you because we gave away all our stuff on Mother's Day, but that's okay. You're still honored. You may be seated. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and do what we normally do. We'll have a welcome time. We begin our services, our worship time, with a time of welcome and greeting. In just a moment, David Satterwhite, our minister of music and our worship team and choir, are going to lead us in our first worship song. And uh, what we do, and if you're a guest, just join right in with us. Nothing very informal, but what we're going to do, uh, after, after, after we sing the song a little bit, Dave's going to give us some instructions. He's going to instruct us to greet people that are standing nearby. So the word standing is important. If you can stand, if you're able to, I want to ask you to stand at this time as we begin our worship.
I'm so glad that I have a heavenly father who has taken me in. He, he, he didn't need to do that. He didn't have to do that. He loves me and he loves you. And there's a place for us in his kingdom and being a part of this wonderful family of God. Our scripture this morning is from Isaiah chapter 64. It says, but now, O Lord, you are our father and we are the clay and you are potter and all of us are the work of your hand. He has given this wonderful wonderful opportunity for us uh, to be a part of this family of believers. But remember, he's the father. He's the potter. We are like the clay. And he wants to mold us. And and if if we listen, if we will follow his voice, then he will do beautiful things in our lives. This is a very important message for us to have. God is a, he's a great father. He's a good, good father. We have have never sung this song on Father's Day. Uh, Today we're going to sing it. He is a good, good father. Let's sing it. Who you are, and I'm loved by 
Ushers can come forward now. For the offering. Let's pray for the offering. God, I just want to thank you for being a good father. You don't have to love us, but you do. So God, I pray for this offering that you would help this church use it for your kingdom, Lord, for the spread of the gospel in our community. That it will be used in the right way, in the right places, that people can know who you are and know that you're a good father. And I just pray this in your holy name, Lord. Amen.
right, so in the bulletin it says there's supposed to be a video, uh, but unfortunately we don't have a video. We have a slideshow, so that means you have to listen to me talk more than there would have been if there was a video. So you're welcome for that this morning, but I got to gift you in that. But um, if we look in Scripture, we see that the mission of God exists because worship of God does not. And so missions is something that we can do. We can go to places like we do. We can go to Peru. We can go to Turkey. We can go to Utah. We can go anywhere. But the first place that we should um, look to serve and to go out on mission is, is right outside our doors in our own community. And so this past week, we had the opportunity to do that. This is our second year uh, getting to do Come Closer, which is a camp that originally started with Hope Point Church here in Spartanburg. And uh, this is our second year getting to partner with them. They, they, they are so gracious to us to, to allow our youth group to come and, and to serve alongside them. But we, we spent uh, this past Sunday and Wednesday um, staying at SMC, Spartanburg Methodist's campus, alongside Hope Point. And uh, our theme for this week, as you can see on the t-shirt, was uh, to live fully alive, which, which comes from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5. Uh, it talks about God being rich in mercy and in love, has loved us by making us alive in Jesus. And so our students got to sit under some incredible teaching time, uh, some, some incredible uh, testimonies from missionaries. We spent our, our morning sessions just kind of uh, through some evangelism training, so looking at things like preaching the gospel to ourselves daily uh, and, and looking at not, not just the gospel being something that we deliver of first importance, but if we want to deliver it of first importance, it's something that we must receive of first importance on a daily basis. We looked at how to share the gospel with other people um, through this really cool uh, gospel presentation with Lego blocks uh, through, a, through an organization called Christ in Youth. And then the last, the last day, we got to look at um, how to look for the gospel in, in the scriptures. So looking upward, inward, and outward. So asking questions of what does this passage say about God? What does this passage say about us? And what does the passage ultimately call us to do? Um, and, and through that, ultimately, it shows us what the passage that we're looking at tells us to say. Or it tells us what it means. Um, but in the night sessions, we got to hear some incredible testimonies, like I said, from missionaries. One that stuck out to a lot of our students was a man by the name of Dwayne Ostrom, um, who's worked with the IMB throughout the years. Um, but one story that just stuck out more than the other, uh, he actually spent three years, I forget the name of the jungle, so if anybody remembers it, just yell it out. Um, but he, he spent time in, in, in a jungle where there was not much uh, human interaction. And he spent three years there, and something that stuck out to me was he did not, not just that he didn't talk to another human being, he did not see a human being that lived there for a year and a half. He spent three years there, and for the first year and a half, did not see another human being. And that just convicted me, because on a daily basis, as you know, on a daily basis, we see people all the time. And how many of us are, for myself specifically, how many of the times are we having gospel conversations with them? So that was something that was super awesome to get to hear and get to sit under that. Um, but, but one of the, 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 the most fun things that we get to do and one of the most life-changing things that we got to do is we got to partner with a local ministry by the name of Sidewalk Cope. And we, we have people in our church and our community that serve alongside that. But if you're unfamiliar with what Sidewalk Cope is, um, it, it was started uh, by a lady named Chip Walters, and she basically had a conviction for um, kids living in the inner city of Spartanburg. So she actually uh, bought and renovated an old box truck that actually they pull up, and the side of it comes down and becomes a stage, as you can see up there, becomes a stage. And on a, on a weekly basis, uh, basically does mini VBSs, has songs, lessons, games, arts and crafts, different things like that. And so we, as, as our students, um, and as the two churches coming together, we got to partner alongside them and go to uh, four different apartment complexes here in Spartanburg. Barksdale, which is a new location that they have that they've just started uh, partnering with. Crescent Hill, Prince Hall, and uh, Collins Park, which I got the honor to, to be at. And it is just super awesome um, getting to just hang out with those kids. Um, just getting to love on them and show them the love of Jesus that they usually don't get to see in the home. And I know if you talk to any of our students, um, 
they would say the same thing. Um, and so with, with that being said, I just, I just want to give a huge thanks for everybody that was involved, but specifically our volunteers. Um, I know all of them aren't here this morning, but they made me look a lot better than I actually am. And they made my week a lot easier just by putting in work, whether it was just arts and crafts, setting stuff up, whatever it was. So I thank you um, for allowing us to get to do that, for your support, for your prayers. And um, I think Michelle, you're next. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Good morning. I don't really know how well this is going to go because I move a lot. But um, I'm Michelle. Y'all probably haven't heard my name at all over the last few weeks, but I am uh, the new children and family minister. And I just got back from kids camp late last night, and they just rolled in about five minutes ago. So they're actually here at the church safely. So thank you for your prayers. It was super fun, but I'm kind of glad I don't have to hold a microphone because my arms are really sore from the zip line. But anyway, um, so I just started my first week, and they threw me into kids camp. And I loved it. With that being said, VBS is in another week. So as I got here, I was going over everything. And I just think it really would be great um, to have some of you come alongside us. We, I'm not going to beg you because as the body of Christ, we know when we need to step up and help. But I just want you to know that coming from First Baptist North Spartanburg to here, I just really want to say something that I shared with Ryan. I told her this morning, I'm kind of weepy this morning. We just had such an amazing night last night at kids camp, but y'all so good seed here. You really do. I've only been a part of this church for a week and I'm already seeing the fruits of the good seed you're sowing. And that looks like sometimes standing in the hallway and greeting kids at vacation Bible school. It really does. And from a girl who was not raised in church, pretty much the only exposure I had was vacation Bible school when I was allowed to go. It matters. It matters. And we do have to have people come alongside and help us with that. So I'm asking you, come get to know me so I can get to know you, but let's sow some more good seed with Vacation Bible School. I promise you won't regret it. These babies are sweet. Listen, I was not even going to stay the night at kids camp because I'm like, I'm brand new. They don't really know me. I don't know them. I have three children and my two younger ones were with me and I thought, I don't know how they'll do this. They gave me the eyes. You know what I'm talking about? Friday night, if you've ever had kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, cousins, whatever, and they give you the eyes, I was like, fine. So I drove all the way back home an hour, packed my stuff, and drove all the way back Friday night because they gave me the eyes. I'm not going to give you the eyes this morning. I'm just asking you to please just go where the Holy Spirit leads you, even if it's just one morning, to stand at the, excuse me, stand at the door and say, good morning. That's it. I promise I'll put you somewhere that I, I feel like the Holy Spirit leads me to put you. Okay, with that being said, Chuck's asked me to pray this morning, so let's pray. Abba, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the fathers in this room, God, coming from a very messy, broken home where I never really had a father figure. I am so thankful that I can call you Daddy. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful to be a part of a church, Lord, this morning who honors their fathers, who knows how important that role is, and sows good seed. And I get to worship with them this morning corporately, and I get to hear the word preached with them this morning. And I'm just really moved by that. I really am weepy, and I think it's because you really are a good, good father, and I'm reminded of that every single day. What a privilege it is to come into your house this morning, Father. And on this Father's Day, I am reminded that you really are the God you say you are. You really are the Father you say you are. And you didn't have to send Jesus, but you did because you love us so much. And I just praise you this morning for that. I ask that you pour out a holy anointing over this congregation this morning and you surprise Chuck with the words that come out of his mouth, that you deliver the message you have for your people straight to their hearts. And may we be open to receive it this morning, God. I love you so much. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for Robert Baptist Church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
So raise your hand if you've ever worked in a restaurant before. If you're somebody who's like, wow, there's a lot of people. Okay, that's something I've never done before. I've always wanted to, um, but I never have. And I don't know why I've wanted to before, but this morning I went to Sunday school class and I had three volunteers. They didn't know when they came to church that they were going to be part of the service, but now they are. So, come on crew, these are my people. Look at that, they look good, don't they? Notice no wives volunteered, just the husbands, but that's okay. Y'all stay right there. All right, well, I've always wanted to go to a restaurant, but I'm always amazed by how much that goes on to be a waiter or a waitress. Because uh, what they do is they bring you in, they're like, welcome, here's your menu, some good stuff. And the person goes back over here, and then they come back and they're like, would you like something to drink? What do you want to drink? Okay, great, all right, I'll go get that. <laughs> they didn't say anything, they're nervous, I'll come back, right? I put them for a drink, and I say, okay, what do y'all want to eat? You know what you want to eat yet? And then they get that, and then I come over here, I come back, and I bring them their salad, and I give them their salad, and they got their salad. You like the salad? Okay, good. And you come back here, and then you come back and you bring the food. You're like, good food. You're like, you want some more to drink? Okay, hold on one second. Come back here. And you come right here. And you come back here. Put your glasses on. And it's like this. Get your right. Right? I'm actually not saying anything now. And then, come and then, like, and that's exhausting. Like, that's what it's like to be. So thank you, every single person that's ever worked in a restaurant. Thank you. There you go, Tim. Tim's like, of all people to pack, Tim likes. No, I'm just kidding. All right. It's crazy how much work is involved in a restaurant. Now, take it to another level. Let's see if this microphone is on. We're going to put it right here, and one of you has to hold it and answer. You don't have to answer first. You're just the one that starts with the microphone. So we're going to move to another category. That's being a waiter. So yeah, I'm supposed to do this. It works. That's being a waiter. Another thing I want you to think about for a second is what do we like to go to prison? All right. It's crazy to sit in a courtroom and realize that when that judge speaks, whatever that judge says is what's about to happen to you. We live in America where we're free and we can do whatever we want. But if you've ever been in a courtroom before and you're on trial, whatever that judge says, if that judge says you're free, you get to go home. If that judge says you're going to prison for 10 years, you don't get to go home and pack your stuff. You don't get to have a goodbye party. You leave that room with officers, and they take you to a place that looks like this. And so it's a different kind of life. So I have some questions I want you to think about, and they're going to be your voice, okay? That's why I've got them up here. All right, the first question I want you to think about, the idea of prison for a second, is this question right here. What do you think it would be like to be in prison? Think about that for a second. If it was you. You specifically had to go to prison. What do you think it'd be like? One of y'all answer. Doesn't matter which one. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. <laughs> Anybody else want to add more to that? Not good. Not good. There we go. All right. <laughs> See? This is what we have to work with. Number two. <laughs> what do you think the hardest thing would be? Think about it for a second. What do you think the hardest thing would be if you were now in prison for 10 years? Not being able to leave. Not at all. You couldn't leave at all. You have no. You can't leave at all. Anything else? Uh, someone telling you what to do every minute of the day. Every minute of the day. All right, let's look at the next question. It says this, what do you think you would miss the most? Think about it for a second. If you were in prison for 10 years, what do you think you would miss the most? Y'all the voice. Let's see what you got. Leaving. Do what? Being able to come and go. Come and go? What else would you miss? What would you miss most? Being able to be around friends and family and Your being able to do fun stuff. My father-in-law. Your father-in-law. <laughs> I tried to hook you up, dude. You, you really bombed. But think about what you'd miss. Like, everything you like to do, you can't do for 10 years. All right. Last question. What has actually been taken from you? Think about that. What has actually been taken from you? Any answers? Your freedom. Your freedom. Everything. Everything. All right, let's go a little further. We had the waiter. We talked about prison. Now let's talk about something else. Did y'all just pass the microphone? There you go. Let's talk about slavery. All right, let's look at this, this word and think about it for a second. Here's a question for you. Someone, one of the three of you, try to explain slavery as if you... <laughs> Someone tried to explain slavery as if you were talking to someone that has never heard of the word before. 
How would you explain that to them? Slavery is essentially controlling someone's life that isn't your own. Okay. All right. Very good. Anybody else want to read the final letter? You like that? I do like that, but uh, I guess someone having a master. Okay. That is like involuntary, or whatever the word is. That okay. Yeah. All right. Think about the two things they just said. That's big. It's really big. Next question. What was the role of the person in slavery? What was the person's role in slavery? To do whatever they were told. Absolutely whatever they were told. Next question. What was the role of the master? To tell the person what to do. Tell the person what to do. All right. Give them a hand. Have a seat, guys. All right. So... I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a really big Dodger fan. And there's a, there's a guy that's not on my team anymore. It's Puig. Yasiel Puig. He liked to do weird things like lick bats, beat himself with a bat. He could even break a bat over his knee. Uh, but one of the things I love to do is to go to Dodgers games, especially away games. And <clears throat> one year, he's actually on Cincinnati Reds now, but it's probably better that way. But we were out about me and Luke Mott and Ethan. And we went to St. Louis to watch him play. And we went to the Ark, right? And uh, if you've ever been there before, it's crazy. You go to the, all the way to the top of that thing. They basically put you in a washing machine, a real small thing. And you go up all the way up there, and you're right there. And then you come all the way back down. And I don't know about you, but I'm very claustrophobic. There was a lot of mental stuff going on, going up there until you got out. It's scary. You should go. All right? And, but underneath here, it's all underground. Like, people, there are people right now that are underneath the ground that are right there. And we had gone up, and we had come back down, and in the distance, I saw Pui. All right, I saw him, and I was like, dude, that's Pui. And Ethan and Luke are like, seriously? I was like, no, that's Pui, I promise you. And they're like, you've got to go talk to him. I was like, okay. And so I went up to him, and he was talking to a guy in Spanish, and I was like, hey. And he just kept talking to the guy in Spanish. I'm like, hey. Kept talking to the guy in Spanish, and finally, they stopped talking. I'm like, yeah, I got it, guys, okay. Hey, Pui. He ignored me completely, all right? Seriously, just keep walking. And finally, I said what you have to say to get anybody's attention that's a professional athlete. I'll vote for you for All-Star if you take a picture with me. Instantly. He stopped, had the nicest smile, shook my hand. It was like holding a bunny. It was his hands were so soft. Like he looked, he's huge, he's strong, but you touch his hands and they're so soft, all right? So then we took a picture together. There it is. I make him look small, don't I? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, thought. yeah I thought he was real big. And I don't know what I'm doing with my hand. It just got stuck there because he had his hand up. So I thought I'd put my hand up there. I'm not holding anything. My hand's just up. All right? You get nervous. All right? When you're with famous people, you're nervous. And so I was sitting there. I was so excited. But if you've ever met people that know famous people or met famous people before, they love to, like, act like they know them. Like, uh, yeah, we're, we're buddies, man. We're tight. Me and Yasiel. Oh, man, that's his background picture on his phone right now, you know? That's I mean, Coach Kid. I mean, we're tight. We're bros. We're buddies. Well, in Scripture, if you look at the epistles, the very first verse, the epistles write down who they are. All right? These guys followed Christ. They got to see everything that Jesus did. All those things we read about, they saw. It's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to be like, do you see what I see? Yeah, he's walking on water. All right? Like, he, they saw this. We don't have any food, Jesus. He's like, give me what you got. We'll feed everybody. They saw that. And then all this happens. Christ came down the cross for sins, ascended to heaven. And now they're telling everybody about this. And they get to start their letters off by saying who they are. And you know, if I wrote the letter, I'd be like, man, I'm Chuck. Me and Jesus were bros, man. We're tight. Yeah, we, we, we rolled together. You know, we, we walked on water for a little bit together, you know. I ran real fast and I sank. No, we, you know, you say these things to try to be equal, but it's interesting. In scriptures, the, they did something different. Let's look at some of these real quick. Let's see what they did. Very first sentence of each one of these, what they said. Paul said, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. Then James said, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter says, Simon Peter, a bond servant of the apostle Jesus. Jude says, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Each one of them use that word. Now, your Bible, you might open up and look at it. It says, well, it just says servant, bond servant, servant. What do they say? What's that word? What's the word? Well, that's the word. Y'all are like, some people have been asking, what's the title? It's doulos, all right? I'm fluent in Greek. <laughs> you can just Google, all right? It's real simple, all right? That's the word. 
This is the word in your Bible when it was not translated in English, but it was in Greek. And that's what you saw. And this is what Paul, Jude, James, Peter are all saying. And we in our Bibles use this word right here. But what's interesting is when you translate a Bible, you have people that speak English. They're reading Greek. They know both. And they've got to pick a word to put it in English, right? And so they try to fit a word that best suits the Greek word. And most of the time, they use the word servant and bond servant. But if you have a study Bible, you can actually look. And if you look at my Bible, it says servant. It's got this little bitty one on it, all right? It says servant. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. It's got this little bitty one. So you go to the bottom of my page, and you look, and you see what the word actually is. It's slave. That's the actual word. Doulos is slave. Now this is tough. This is a tough word, especially in our culture, because of our history, the history of this word, and what it means, and the horribleness that came with that word, and the things that we saw that men do to men that men should never do to men, or women, or children. And so the people translating it sees this word, and they got to figure out what English word can I use? Well, I don't want to use that word because it has a terrible, terrible meaning. So I'm going to use a different word like bond servant are servants. But the problem with that is just like the first illustration I gave, is there's a big difference between a waiter, a person in prison, and a slave. And so because we use different words than the actual word being used, we actually don't get the full meaning of the word. If it's a waiter, if it's a serve, then what's great about that is I got to serve those guys, but I get to clock in and clock out. I get to get so frustrated with them, I can actually just quit serving them. Or you got the person in prison whose freedom has been taken, but I don't know if you know, most people in prison, they do what they're told, but they're not told to do much. They're just there. Their freedom has been taken from them. They're stuck. They just can't leave. But if you're this person, you're both of those. You have to serve and you're stuck. You're not just stuck in this house. You have to do whatever your master says, and your master has a lot to say. So we have this word, this word slave, and if you grew up in, your, in the schools here, you studied the history in our country about slavery, and it's awful, it's ugly, and it's a hard word to look at. And I'm taking steps here, and I'm trying to walk carefully, but the thing that we don't realize is it's not just our culture and country that has had slavery. Throughout the world, slavery is happening. Even the people we read about in the Bible were slaves. The Hebrews, they were slaves for over 400 years. Paul is talking to the Jews. They knew what slavery was. They not only knew it, but it was still happening. It's not even happening in our country right now. It's just something that did happen, and we're working through it. It was actually happening at the minute Paul wrote this word. It was taking place right then. And so let's look at something. Let me just show you what this word really is unique and different. In the Old Testament, there's a word very similar to it. It's kind of the Hebrew version of it. But in Exodus 21, 2, and you may have heard this before, but follow along with me. It says this. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. So you have a slave. I bought a slave. He's got to serve me for six years. But on the seventh year, guess what? He gets to go. He is free. And then the verse keeps going. And it says this, But if the slave plainly says, I love you, my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God and shall bring him to the door, to the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through the owl and he shall be his slave forever. So someone is a slave they're actually set free, and then that slave gets to make a choice. Do I want my freedom, or do I want to go back to where I've always been? And he has a choice. And when he makes that choice, that's the choice he has to live with the rest of his life. So when he turns back into the house and says, no, I'd rather be a slave than to be free, he, does, he never gets that choice again. Never happens again. And that's the word that Paul is using to describe himself. That's the word that Jude is using to describe himself. And Peter, 
These guys who walk with Jesus, who aren't saying, yeah, we were bros. No, they're saying, I am a slave to Christ. They get one sentence to say who they are, and they chose to be a slave. You know, we're talking about discipleship. We're trying to make disciples in this church. That's our goal, is to make a disciple. What I want to know is, do we understand what that means? What you're signing up for? Do we get it? Do we understand how extreme we're talking? All right. Now, seeing this word, it still feels uncomfortable. And I want to be very clear. Paul is not an advocate of slavery. (laughs) He is not for slavery. He actually wrote about it. He actually said these words. So I want you to know these words that he actually said. He said, were you a slave when you were called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can give, if you can gain your freedom, do so. He said, man, if you're a slave, man, if you can get your freedom, get it. He's not telling them to stay. You no, know, you have to always be slave. You're always, no, he's like, hey, get your freedom. And then he says some really important things. For he who was called of the Lord as a slave, he's a free man. So if you're a slave and you give your life to the Lord, you're a free man. He also says something very big, too. He says, likewise, he who was free, wait, you who were bought with a price, wait, I missed out, sorry. For he who was called of the Lord is a slave, is a free man. Likewise, he who was free when he called is a slave of Christ. So if you think, if you were free and you give your life to the Lord, you're now a slave to Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So Paul is not for slavery in a man versus man. Let me be very clear. It's never okay for a man to own a man, a woman, or a child. Ever. There's no exception. There's no question mark. We are in a country that believes in equality. It was something we're still working through. But if you're a follower of Christ, you are a slave to Christ. Now, let's look at this. There's still a problem. There's a problem because that word that you've studied for so long in the country that we live in, that talks about freedom. We're going to shoot fireworks soon, I hope. Blow things up, it's going to be great. We love freedom. It's something we don't, but what we don't realize is that mentality leaks into our understanding of our role as a disciple. So one of the things we struggle with when we see the word slave is this right here. If we are not a slave, then Jesus is not our master. We had one guy say that. He did an awesome job. Now, when I was a youth minister, uh, I like to play this game. It was called soccer wrestling. And we go on this retreat, and we pulled out mattresses. And the object of the game is you pull it up, just so you'll be very clear, this is Will Sexton, all right, just so everybody knows. And that's Cameron, AJ, and uh, that guy, Ben, you know, that guy. So the object of the game was to take the other person's socks off, all right? That's the goal, all right? And it was so much fun. We had a guys' retreat, and we did the guys' did that. We had a girls' retreat. The girls did a much better job. They don't have so much pride issues. But the guys, they tried. They worked hard. They went at it. All right, and as soon as you say go, they go at it. It was so much fun to watch them just wear each other out. Just to be clear, as we proceed, there is Danny Grice right there laughing, watching the whole time. All right, so anything that you see from this point forward, just know he was there smiling the whole time. And they wrestled. And then after a while, different matches happened. See, that was a very good matchup right there. But then there came a matchup between Luke Mott and Ben Grice. All right, Luke Mott's a very big dude. At this time, Ben Grice was probably in 7th or 8th grade, not a big dude, all right? And I kept thinking, I'm like, this is not going to go well. Why are we letting this happen, all right? Who's in charge, right? right? Like, who's in charge? And, I, and, and they wanted it. They wanted to do it. I was just like, maybe they thought they could do something. Maybe he thought, but I guess Ben looked at Luke and just had some kind of plan that I didn't see. Because as soon as I said go, this is what happened. Nope, That. Luke Mott literally picked Ben Grice upside down and just pulled his socks off like, next. It was the funniest thing. And just be clear, Ben Grice, I mean, uh, you were right there. Danny was right there laughing the whole time. It was the funniest thing in the world. Ben had no shot whatsoever. It's not an equal fight. And we look at this and we say, if we are not a slave, then Jesus is not our master. We don't like the word slave. We don't like the word slave. Obviously, for the reasons, because when man and man, we are equal. That makes sense. That is wrong. But something we forget, at least into our brain, is man and God, not equal. Not equal at all. It's a joke. 
But each one of us has this internal struggle where as much as we want freedom in this area, we want freedom in this area. And all of a sudden we creep up and we don't realize if you're seeking freedom from God, you're trying to be God. And we are not, and if he's not, if you're not a slave for Christ, think about this. If you don't see yourself as a slave to Christ, then he is not your master. And to give your life to the Lord, he saved you from your sins, but from that point forward, he is also your Lord. He is also your master. We have no freedom then. Let's move on. Next problem. Problem number two. If we are just a servant, then we can choose who and when we want to serve. You see, this is my only problem about that translation. I understand those, why they do this. I completely understand why they translate the word bond servant and servant. I understand completely. Because a normal person reading the Bible, all they're going to think about is what you have seen in school. They don't grasp what Paul is really trying to say. And so we have to use a different word. But what we don't realize is it leaks into our mentality of thinking. When you give your life to the Lord, you're this person that's going to come and serve God. When you want to come back, serve God. Come back and serve God. Come back and serve God. When in reality, no, you don't get to choose who and when you serve God. Next problem. We think we are free. We think we are Let's read the passage. All right. In John 8, 31, it says this. To the Jews who had believed Jesus, he said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've all heard this before. It makes sense. You're like, yeah. But interesting enough, if Jesus was here, and he was telling our culture this, they would, we would say the exact same thing that is about to be said. You ready? They said this. They answered Jesus. Wait, 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 wait. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? That's exactly what you would say. And every one of your friends, if you brought your friends to hear Jesus speak, and Jesus says, hey, I want to set you free. They're like, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'm an American. I ain't no slave. Don't be calling me that. I'm not a slave. You do not call me that. I have free. I can do what I want. When I want, I am free. And that's when Jesus says something that I said earlier at the beginning of the service because it's so hard for us to hear, just like it's so hard for them to hear. It's not that Jesus has lied up to this point. It's not that he was deceiving them. He was saying, what I'm about to say is hard for you to comprehend. I'm telling you, this is truth, what I'm about to say. Truly, truly, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Let me tell my guys, come back up. They're terrified. They don't know what they're about to have to do. Come back up, guys. All right. All right, we're going to put you, Myers, right here and stand right there. Come over here, Emery. You stand right here. Hold that right there. You got it? You're doing great. You're doing fantastic. All right. Put your hands out, bud. All right. All right, we'll stand in the middle. All right, so let's read the passage now. In Romans 6, 16 through 23, you ready? Let's, let's get an idea of what's being said here. It says this, Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, so come over here. No, just kidding, just kidding. Good job. Or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Come over here. Next verse says this, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, come over here, bud, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because your natural limitations. Think about that. Paul's literally saying you're limited in understanding this. For just as you once presented your members, over here, bud, as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members, over here, as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were a slave of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Think about this. Nope, nope. Good try. Think about that verse for a second. It says, for when you were a slave of sin, when you were here, when you were a slave here, you were free from that. 
It, you were free from that. But what fruit were you getting at that time? From the things that of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. So you're free from righteousness, but if you're a slave here, you get death. That's what you get. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And it's in eternal life. You see, it's not just about eternal life. As soon as you give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and it begins to mold and shape you and create you holy and pure to become like Christ. And you get eternal life. All right? And then the verse that we all know, you've heard a thousand times before, we use it to share the gospel, but we don't think about slavery while we're doing it. It says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You've heard that verse a lot of times. Think about what it's actually saying now. For the wages of sin is death. So if you were a slave over here, you could say, it's death. Or you can be a slave over here, and it's eternal life. But what does not change throughout the whole passage? You're a slave. What we miss out is that right there. We think we are free. Man, are we wrong. You are not free. You're a slave. The question is, what are you a slave to? Are you a slave to Christ? Are you a slave to sin? But one way or another, the thing that doesn't change. And see, in our mind, I know somehow or another we missed this, whether it was because we had to use the word bond servant or we had to use servant or the way we teach. I don't know what it is, but there's this mentality of Christ came to set you free from sin. And so we feel like the chains are cut free and he lets you out the door to go do whatever you want to do. And that's not what scripture says. I don't know if, if, if we did a bad job of teaching that or you didn't see it or what. But no, you get to choose. Are you going to be tied up to sin or to righteousness? Which is it? You're going to be tied up. You were never free. You're always a slave. It's just to what? And what's terrifying is what you don't realize is many of us are slaves to this world. And this world could care less about Christ. It could care less about how it ends for you. Next problem. As much as you want it to be, or try to make it, it's not your life. If you ever came to a point in your life where you would give your life to the Lord, and you say, Lord, I understand that I'm a sinner, and I know I can't do anything to get to heaven, and I'm asking you to come and be my Savior and my Lord, what you're saying, I don't know if you knew you were saying this, what you were saying is, here is my life, take it. Listen to these verses and tell me how we can miss this. In 1 Corinthians it says, it's not yours. This is not your life. You were bought for a price. So glorify your body for him. Galatians 2.20 says, for I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. Listen, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Luke 9, 23 says, I am supposed to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Everybody know what a sacrifice is? Usually it's dead. We're asking for a living version, but regardless, you've given it up. This is what a disciple. It is someone who is truly understood. It's not your life. I am a slave. The question is, who am I a slave to? And so this is what I want to challenge you to think about. All right? Each one of us is struggling. We struggle with stuff. We struggle with this pride. We struggle with our dominancy. We struggle with what we think is freedom, but reality is rejection of Christ. Being free from Christ is rejecting Christ. It's not freedom. And each one of us, my challenge to you is to, at some point in your life, to be able to say this sentence right here. Not Chuck, obviously, but your name. Chuck, a slave to 
Christ. Does that rub you the wrong way? Does that bother you to say, Tim, a slave to Christ? Myers, a slave to Christ. Carrie, a slave to Christ. Matt, a slave to Christ. Rodney, a slave to Christ. Cindy, a slave to Christ. Can you write that sentence? Can you get a blank piece of paper and write that down? And if it bothers you, you need to ask a bigger question. What's bothering you? What's, what is it that's holding you back? What is it that's messed you up, that's got you from not being able to write that, that sentence down? It's the greatest joy you can ever have is to be a slave for Christ and not a slave to this world. Who are you going to be a slave for? Let's pray. Father, you are a jealous God. You're a jealous God because you know that you're the best option. That you know there's no better way, no better option than you. And you loved us so much that you want us to have that option. So what I pray right now for this room, this group of believers, this group of people that may not be believers... They may have thought they understood what the gospel is, but now they really do. Lord, each one of us is struggling with some stuff, some stuff we're holding on to, realizing that if we're a slave, God, that we have a master. We have given up our freedom and we do whatever you ask us to do. And so, Lord, whatever's holding us back, whatever's in the way, God, I pray you'll break that. You'll break that and set us free, as you said. Set us free so that we can be chained to you instead of what we're chained to. God, help us to understand what you're offering. Make it ever clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a second, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. I really want you to think about that last sentence. Can you say that? I want you to pray. I want you to pray for the people around you. Is there someone here right now that's struggling with this and they need you to be praying for them? Because if our church is going to start reaching our community for Christ, if we're going to make a difference in a week and a half, a week when those kids come in the doors, because we have to have a room full of soldiers that have given their life to serve the Lord and said, I am a slave to Christ and I want you to know the freedom that comes with that. So this is the time to worship. We're going to sing. You can come down and pray. You can turn around and kneel right at your bench, at your a pew, and pray. You can pray with a friend. Whatever you feel like the Lord's calling you to do right now, I ask you to follow that. If you would, please stand as we worship. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure. All of my days are held in your hand. Crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life.
strong way today. Have a seat for a second, if you would. Eric, if you would, join beside me, Eric. I'm going to have Eric hide. Come here up beside me. Eric came down, and uh, Eric's already given his life to the Lord. He's just joining from another sister church. And we just want to welcome him into, a, into the church. Robert, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just the associate pastor. Yeah, that's going to be your real boss, all right? That's my boss. But uh, we appreciate you coming down today. And, and, and if y'all would join with me and, and his commitment to join our church, we would by saying amen. Amen. And uh, in just a second, we're going to walk around to that way, and we'll be in the back. But I want to thank my three guys for what they did, uh, being willing to come up. Next time, I'll get three other different people. So appreciate you doing that, and we'll pass it on to Tim. He would. Well, amen. Eric, go, you go with Chuck. You guys go ahead and get a head start. I want to thank Chuck for his good word this morning. That was a, that's a tough message, but it's one we all need to hear. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thank all of you for being here today. Remember what Michelle just talked about a few moments ago about Vacation Bible School. Everybody can help, even if you can only help one day. So if you can, there's a sign-up sheet out in the Information Center. Sign up. Come and be a part of the most important thing, one of the most important things we do all year at Roebuck Baptist Church as we reach into our community at Vacation Bible School. All right, Wayne Hall is our Deacon of the Week. He's going to come and have our benediction. If you will, let's stand together as the service closes. Let us pray. Our most gracious Father, you are a good, good Father. And not just this day, but every day, let us remember that. That on this Father's Day especially is a great time to remember that and to be grateful for our fathers who came to us and those who have helped us grow and become better disciples of you. We thank you for them. We thank you for all they do for us. We thank you for everything that's going on in this church. If you pay attention to all the staff, how active they've been this past week with our church, reaching out to our community, to our um, convention, to, to everything that is going on. We thank you for the work that was done by the youth as they went out into the um, areas of the uh, city and took the word and uh, had vacation Bible schools across the city. We thank you for what was going on with um, the people from um, Child Evangelism Fellowship that were here getting ready to go out and have gone back to their homes from all around the state. They were here learning and getting ready to go. And our church was a part of that, and we thank you for the opportunity to have done that, and we pray that you will help them take your word to the many schools and to the locations and throughout the state that they will be going to. We thank you for um, the young um, children who had their, their time to go and for their time to grow and to get to know Michelle. And I'm looking forward to everything that she's going to be doing. And we hope that we can all help with Vacation Bible School do things to make it grow. Help us to take Chuck's word, understand what it is to be a slave, and that we be a slave to you, Jesus, and to God. In all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.